All right, now if you remember last week, in Genesis chapter 30, uh, Jacob was ready to, to leave. But Laban's like, no, you know, don't go. I want you to stick around. And, and last week, in, in, you know, when we went over chapter 30, we saw Laban's attitude towards Jacob. And it was one where he was very appreciative. He recognized, you know, when Jacob said, you know, when I got here, your flock was little. When I got here, you didn't have that much. And even Laban acknowledged, yeah, you know, God's really been blessing me for your sake. God's been blessing all of his cattle. You know, he was getting all this great abundance simply because Jacob was there and he was blessing Jacob. And we learned last week, we saw how much of a hard worker Jacob was. We see that even into this chapter as well, how much, you know, how much he's really working and putting forth effort for Laban. He's in a great employee. Last week, we saw that Laban basically said, you know, name your price. Tell me your wage and I'll pay it for you because he wanted him to stay that bad. So here we are in chapter 31 now. Six years have gone by. He's been working for Laban. He did the first 14 years to pay basically for his daughters, for, to marry Leah and to marry Rachel. He put in seven years apiece for each of those wives. He served 14 years of his life just for the dowry for those, for those wives that he took unto himself. And then he worked an extra six years for the cattle. Basically, the, the agreement was he was going to get all the spotted and speckled and ring strict. Anything that kind of looked like it, it wasn't um, you know, like a pure color, like all brown or all white or whatever you know the ones that would have been probably more valuable he would he said okay Laban you're gonna have these and he got the other ones now God had made it because he had given him this dream and I'm not gonna go through everything so I'm kind of giving you a, an overview right now and we're gonna go through and go through a lot of the verses it's a long chapter but we covered a lot last last week as well as far as God showing him that dream and he knew what what God was gonna bless him with so when he appointed him his wages he said okay well this is what I want to earn I'll take all of these he had already seen in a dream that God was going to bless that and that, that he was going to get abundance that way. And God was really making it right. All the hard work that he did, you know, Laban changed his wages 10 times. He really wasn't treating them properly. But God saw all of that and God made it right. And, but what, what we start off here in chapter 31, the reason why I'm kind of going through all this was, is, to, is to show you the difference, the change in heart now that Laban has after six years. Before, he was a lot more humble and saying, yeah, you know, I know that God's blessed me because of you. You know, when, when he came, he didn't have a whole lot. Now he's amassed a great wealth. And unfortunately, this is what happens oftentimes when people start to amass wealth. They start to get a little bit proud and they start to get greedy. And you'll, one thing you'll notice about Laban as well from this chapter, he didn't serve God. He didn't serve the Lord. When he came pursuing after Jacob, one of his gods was stolen. He worshipped false gods. He was not a Christian. He, was not, he did not serve the Lord. So we start to see people, and this happens, I mean, it happens now. It's, it's, it's things that people do. It's, it's a, oftentimes it's a, an effect of attaining too much wealth. They start to get envious of other things. Now, he made this agreement with Jacob. But look at how his sons and his family is acting in verse number 1 of chapter 31. It says, And he heard the words of Laban's son. So I'm about Jacob. Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's. Now, Jacob or Laban's sons, of course, they're going to be receiving Laban's inheritance. So they're looking on this and saying, they're looking at Jacob and saying, well, he's stealing all of Laban's stuff, all of our father's stuff, and he's going to be taking this stuff and we're not going to get anything. And really it's because God's blessing him. This was his appointed wages. It was agreed upon. But now they're starting to look at Jacob with disdain. You know, before it was great because they're just, they're amassing all of this stuff. And before when he was working, he was only working for the daughters. So he didn't have to pay him all these wages now of cattle, of the, the sheep and the goats and these other things that he's going to be earning. But after six years, they start looking at this stuff and going, wait a minute. He's taken all this stuff away, all, all, and, they, and they're attributing it to all, all of our father's stuff, as if it belongs to him, even though they've already agreed for these wages. And it says, And of that which was our father's, hath he gotten all this glory? Verse 2, And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. So now, even Laban's also kind of looking at him and saying, You know what? He's starting to see that he's losing you know, wealth or whatever, and he's not looking at Jacob the same way as he had before. Verse number three, And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. So this is really the turning point now for Jacob. He's been working for six years, for, you know, for 20 years total. 
but for these past six years for wages. And God tells him now, he's like, okay, now it's time for you to go back. I want you going back into that land because he wants to, you know, obviously he's going to fulfill um, the prophecies and everything else, and he wants them out of that land. The reason why he even went to sojourn that land to begin with was to find a wife and to get away from his brother Esau because Esau was going to kill him. So now it's 20 years later and God says, okay, Jacob, it's time for you to get back home. Verse number three, or verse number uh, four. And look at, well, verse number three, let's read that again. And the Lord said unto Jacob, return unto the land of thy fathers and thy kindred. And I like this last phrase, and I will be with thee. God's promising him, saying, look, I'm going to be with you. and Because he, he knows that he's still probably, I know for a fact, actually, it's not, it's not a question. He's worried about what Esau is going to be like when he goes back. And we'll see that in the chapters to come when he starts sending out all these gifts and stuff before him because he's worried about how his brother's going to receive him. But God already is comforting him, saying, look, this is what I want you to do, and I'll be with you. And we can take this, this to the bank. You know, anytime you're in God's will, when you're doing what God has told you to do, when, you, when we're doing what, what God has lined up for us to do, God's going to be with us. You know, oftentimes people get worried about going out, knocking on doors. Maybe it's a crummy neighborhood. Maybe you're going out in the ghetto. Look, I've, I've knocked plenty of doors in the ghetto. And people will say that, like, aren't used to that. Or, or maybe they don't go out knocking doors. They'll be like, well, aren't you scared? Don't you, you know, isn't that dangerous? Look, if I'm doing God's will, which giving people the gospel of Christ is doing God's will. There's no doubt about that. I know that I am in God's will when I'm doing that. When I'm out and, and serving God in that way, hey, God's with me. When I'm doing what he's told me to do, I know he's with me. So is the neighborhood maybe a little bit more dangerous? Sure. But I'll tell you what, I've never seen anything happen to anybody out soul winning ever in any, in any neighborhood. Rich, poor, whatever. I've never seen it happen. And... Um, like I said, God, God's capable of protecting us. If He's with us, what do we have to fear? If God be for us, who could be against us? And we need to maintain that type of an attitude. But we see that here. It's reassuring. It's nice. It's comforting to know, hey, I don't need to get down. I don't need to get worried. I don't need to be scared. You know, um, the only fear that we ought to have is the fear of the Lord. We're not supposed to fear man or what he can do to us. But God gives us that comfort saying that he will be with us. And he gives Jacob that same comfort here in verse 3. Look at verse 4. It says, And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock. And he said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. And he goes on and he explains he calls his wife. So he calls Rachel and Leah. Now, obviously, they're Laban's daughters. And he starts to explain, look, you know how I worked for your dad. You know how he's changed my wages. You know how he's been dealing with me. You know how he's done all this stuff. He said, God blessed me even in spite of all of this. He gave me all these spotted and speckled and ring straked. And he goes on and explains that to him. And he's basically telling him, you know, God's called me now and we need to go back to my family. We need to go back to where I came from and we're going to be leaving. And basically they answer, and we're going to jump down here. Um, verse 14 says, And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? So they're saying, look, even we're counted of our father like strangers. You know, why would we want to stay here, basically, is what they're saying. You know, it says, For he hath sold us and hath quite devoured also our money for all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. And they're saying, basically, you know, God's blessed you. We're your wives. We'll go with you. You know, he's already kind of given up on us anyways. So why would we want to stay here and, and, you know, there with him? Now, I want to jump back real quick because we're skipping over this whole section. I went over quite a bit of it last week. But I wanted to point out when Jacob is telling his wives, uh, you know, all of this stuff and, and that he's leaving, Verse number 13 is where he tells them about God appearing unto him and telling him to go back into his, father's, into his father's land. Verse 13 says, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointedst the pillar. And he's, he's bringing up when God um, originally appeared unto Jacob. And that's when he saw that ladder. It's called Jacob's ladder. It's referred to as that. Then the angels of God ascending and descending upon this ladder. And he called the name of that place Bethel. And he set up this pillar and... Um, he, that's where God appeared to him. So God's making reference to that point. And when that event happened, Jacob vowed a vow. And he said, well, God, if you'll be with me, if you'll protect me, you know, 
you'll be my God and I'll give you the tenth of everything that I, that I make, of everything that you bless me with, basically, is what he said. And the reason why I'm bringing this up, it says here, because God brings that back up to him. He says, look, I'm the God of Bethel, where thou anointedst a pillar, and where thou vowedst to vow unto me. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when you vow a vow, God remembers it. You know, you are not required to make vows unto God. It's not something that he says you have to do. You don't have to make promises. That's what a vow is, is a promise, right? But when you do, God holds you to that and God expects you to keep your promises, to keep your vows and to be a man of your word. And unfortunately, we live in a society today where, where integrity and people who are, who are men of their words is like nothing. People look at lying as if it's just a part of life. Like you can't trust anyone. People say things now and say, oh yeah, well, I was wrong about it. It's not a big deal. Instead of having the, the self-respect and the, and the respect to be able to say, you know what, what the words, if you can't be trusted for the things that you say, then, then what good are you? You know why? Don't you want to be someone who, who when you say something, people can just trust what you're saying. is like, I know this guy. He's, when when he opens up his mouth and he says something, he's telling the truth. Instead of people always have to wonder and think, well, you know, this guy's kind of shady. I never know what he's saying, if it's true, if it's a lie. And as Christians, we ought to be men of our words. We ought to be able to say something and people are, are, are going to have to question and wonder, is that really true? Is what he's saying true? We ought to have this testimony where people can, cannot take our words and just say, oh yeah, he's lying again. Because then why would they believe you about anything that you have to say about Scripture? Why would they believe you about anything that, that you're saying is the truth if you have a poor testimony, if you can't say something and mean it? But look at, turn if you would to um, 2 Corinthians No, excuse me. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I jumped a little bit ahead of my notes. I'm kind of skipping around a little bit. But um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 talks about making vows. And I'll read for you from... Um, oh, I thought I had another reference in here. No, that's all right. Yeah, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're going to be heading right back to Genesis 31. But Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse number 4 says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Say, look, don't, you know, if you're going to make a vow, if you're going to make a promise to God, don't slack on paying it. You pay your vows. You do whatever it is that you said you were going to do. And he says, if you don't, you're a fool. And he says, it's better for you just not to vow at all. Like, don't, don't even say it if you're not going to follow through with it and, and do it. Verse number six says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. So you use your words to say the vow, and if you break your vow, that is a sin. And God, like I said, God's going to hold you to those words. He says, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Oh, I made a mistake. Oh, I didn't really mean to say that. He said, no, if you're going to open up your mouth, you better mean what you say. Don't just, just say, oh, oops, I made a mistake. Oh, that was an error. I didn't mean to say that. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? There's going to be a recompense to pay if you just make a vow and you're not willing to follow through. He says, God's going to destroy the work of your hands. The Bible says in verse 7, For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. And again, the fear of the Lord is missing today from Christians. They think, you know, God has been, his status seems to have been brought down to that of like a buddy or a friend. And you see people, you know, you hear people talking about like, oh, JC, and they'll use these these blasphemous or you know, if nothing else disrespectful names like a buddy buddy as opposed to a father and any good father knows you know you're not your child's friend you're their you're their parent you're their father now you love them you spend time with them you do nice things for them but at the end of the day you're, you're their dad and you have to and they have to treat you with that respect of being the father the same way that we ought to be treating our heavenly father with respect and we don't just throw his name around. That's why we don't use the name of the Lord in vain. It's one of God's commandments. Don't use it around as if it's nothing. That people are just saying, oh, Jesus Christ, and using God's name as a curse word or just, just using it in vain, using it for no reason whatsoever. I mean, if you're doing something on the job and you hurt yourself, why in the world are you just going to just throw out Jesus' name? 
You're, you're putting it out there in vain for no reason. And, and really just using it as a curse word, if, if nothing else. And that is disrespectful. That's blasphemous. We ought not to be doing those things. We need to have more respect for our Heavenly Father and just respect for when you make a vow, you pay it. Now, the biggest thing I think today with people making vows, because typically people aren't making many vows, but there are. Actually, I take that back. Because there are a lot of people. They'll get into trouble. Right? They'll get into trouble with the law or they'll get into trouble some other way and they'll just be like, God, if you get me out of this mess, I'll go to church every week. I'll make sure I read my Bible. I'll do this. I'll do that. And people are always saying those types of things. And how often are people really following through with that? And then maybe they'll get out of those messes. Right? And then they'll wonder why their life gets even worse after that. Well, it's because you're making a vow and you're not keeping it unto the Lord. Now, the biggest vow that's getting broken today is a vow of marriage. People are, are making these vows before God and before man, and they're promising, saying, look, I'm going to be with you until death do us part. Nothing is going to part us except for death. You know, we may have good times, bad times. We may be in sickness. We may be in health. You know, all these different things are part of your vow. You say, None of that is going to split us up. I promise, I vow to you that I will be with you until death. That means no matter what. Amen. Yet people today, the smallest of problems, it's like it's your boyfriend or girlfriend. It's, oh, I'll just get a divorce. Because their word means nothing. And... People's word means nothing. Ought, they ought to be thinking about that before they even get married. Say, look, if you treated your word as something that's important, when you make a vow, when you make a promise, you need to stick to that vow. And God's going to hold that against you. Look, it's, it's, otherwise a vow is meaningless if you're not going to stick to it. What's the point? What's the point of saying anything? And if you're not intending on being married to your spouse until death, then don't make the vow. Don't get married to begin with if that's not your intention. And you have to go into understanding that, look, I'm making this promise. There may be some very bad times ahead. But the Bible says, and my vow says, that I'm not going to get a divorce. I'm not going to separate from my wife. And I'm not going to go into the whole, you know, except for the cause of fornication. Um, God doesn't intend for anybody to get divorced. And I preach entire sermons on that subject alone. But... Um, you know, I just wanted to point that out because God does remember your vows as he remembered to Jacob and he brought it back up to him saying, okay, you know, like, that's where you vowed unto me. That may have been 20 years ago, but I remember that vow. And now I'm bringing you, I'm with you. I'm still here. I'm blessing you, Jacob. But you vowed unto me. Now, now Jacob does keep that vow. I mean, he, he the Lord is his God and, and um, I mean, we don't see any evidence, but I, be, I believe he's probably giving the tenth unto the God. Uh, you know, we, we don't see that written in Scripture, but there's no reason to doubt that he did that. But let's, um, let's go back to Genesis 31. There's actually one other point I wanted to make that we kind of skipped over of what he was talking about with Leah and Rachel. When he said in verse 6, he says, And you know that with all my power I have served your father. He's like, I served him with all my might and, and with every ounce of my being. I was serving your dad and, and being a good employee for him. He says, and your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God suffered him not to hurt me. So God's been with him this whole time. And Jacob's recognizing, look, God's been with me. He said, he's changed my wages. He's lied to me. I've served him nonetheless. And look, this is the way that we ought to be as a Christian, the Christian attitude, the Christian work ethic ought to be that, hey, if your boss is, is lying and deceiving and, and not treating you right, don't start to slack on your job and say, well, if that's how he's going to be, then this is how I'm going to be. And I went over this a little bit last week as well. We need to be above that. We need to be above reproach and we need to be able to say, you know what? I'm going to serve him and basically do unto others the way I'd have them do unto me. So if I were to have employees, this is the employee that I'm going to be for them. And even if your boss is not recompensing you and not giving you proper wages and not treating you the way you ought to be treated, God's going to see it and God will make things right because that's exactly what happened here. Now, Jacob had to do this by faith. For all these years, he was serving by faith and he's getting, you know, I'm sure it's frustrating and he's dealing with all this, but you know what? He still works hard. And in the end, 
God ends up blessing him tremendously, and he's leaving now with all this substance, and he's actually receiving and reaping what he's sown because he's been doing the right thing. You can say, oh, well, he doesn't deserve that. It doesn't matter. The Bible teaches that, that when we work in all things that we do, do them as unto the Lord. If you're working at your job, hey, do it as if you're working for Jesus Christ himself. Do the best job that you can be. Don't let anybody have anything negative to be able to say about you. Say, oh, yeah, I know that guy. He's a Christian, and he slacks off on the job. He's always doing something else. He works with eye service as a man pleaser. When the boss is around, he looks real busy, but then when the boss is gone, he's just slacking and lounging and not doing his job. That ought not to be the way that you are if you're a Christian. And like I said, I don't care if you're underpaid. Everybody's underpaid. Just ask anyone. Just ask, just ask any employee. Are you really making what you think you should be making or do you think you should be making more? Yeah. Show me the person that's going to say, yeah, no, I, I think I'm making exactly what I should be. I don't think I should make it anymore. <laughs> Everybody thinks they should be making more. That's just the way it is, of course. I mean, you hold a high respect for the work that you do. And you think you should be worth, you know, well, I'm worth more than this, you know, but I'm only getting paid this much. Fine. <laughs> But do the job. If you want, if you think you're worth that much, then prove it. Show it. And, and again, if, even if your boss doesn't see it, God sees it. And God will see your hard work and you will get blessed for it. We're in Genesis 31. Uh, let's look at... Um, Verse number 17. Bible reads, Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives upon camels. And he carried away all his cattle and all his goods, which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting, which he had gotten in Padanaram, for to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father. So Rachel steals these false gods, but Jacob's completely unaware of it. And... Um, then it says in verse 20, And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, in that he told him not that he fled. So Jacob decides to just up and leave. Now, there is nothing wrong with Jacob up and leaving. He has every right to do this. His wives are his wives. His, his earnings, the cattle, everything. You know, he didn't steal anything from Laban. Everything that he had, he decided, you know what? I'm going back to my father's house. But he doesn't tell him, you know, he doesn't tell Laban, you know, oftentimes you'd say, you know, you'd think like, well, I should at least tell my family that we're going. You know, I'm sure they're going to want to say goodbye. But Jacob had pretty good reason not to do that. And we, as we see in this chapter, he decides just to go. He's like, okay, Laban's out shearing a sheep. It's time for us to go pack up our stuff. We're gone. And that's what he does. So it says in verse 21, so he fled with all that he had. And he rose up and passed over the river and set his face toward the Mount Gilead. And it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. So after three days of Jacob being gone, now Laban catches wind of this and, and he finds out, hey, they all left, right? So what he does, it says, and he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days journey and they overtook him in the Mount of Gilead. So it takes Laban now, because Jacob's got a three-day head start. It takes him seven days to catch up to him. It says he pursues him hotly. I mean, he's like going after him and with not good intentions. Okay, and now when you start to read this a little bit more, you start to see why Jacob even felt like he had to leave to begin with and just not tell him and just go. Because Jacob now, and think about this. If, if you had family members, right, and they were staying with you and they were staying with you for a long time, but then they just up and left. Are you going to, and it's not like Laban went by himself. He took a lot of people with him and hotly pursued after them. Is that the reaction you're going to have towards them? Or are you just going to be like, okay, they left? Or maybe you'll try to catch up with them and be like, hey, you know, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. You know, what are you doing? Why are you going? And just try to find out what's going on. But that wasn't Laban's intent. Look at what it says um, then in verse number 24. Because after seven days when he overtakes him, God appears unto Laban in a dream. And it says, And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Now, if God tells you don't even speak to Jacob, because that's what he says. He's saying, I don't care if it's good or bad, don't speak unto Jacob. Do you think he should still be continuing to chase after him then and even go and confront him if he's not even supposed to speak not even good to him? God tells him, look, don't even speak good to him. But if, 
But exactly, exactly. And that's the point, is that he didn't believe in the Lord. Now, he had this vision, but he didn't respect God's word, and he's going to break it anyways, right? And that's probably one of the reasons why God said not even to speak to him, because he knows he's going to break it anyways. If he would have just said not to hurt him, he probably would have hurt him, right? This way, he says, well, don't even speak to him. He goes and speaks to him, but then he refrains himself from hurting him. But... Um, you know, Laban didn't have respect, but he did, he did hear that, uh, he did have this dream, this vision. And it even says here when uh, Laban tells Jacob that, he says in verse 29, look at what Laban says, it is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. So that's why he went after him. He said, look, I have the right and the power to hurt you. For what? Because he left? But this is what he thinks. This is what's going through Laban's mind. He's like, I have the right to hurt you, but the God of your father, look, he doesn't say, my God. He says, the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or, or bad. And ultimately, that's why he doesn't hurt him. But it's not Laban's God. It's not, you know, he has no respect unto this, but he's basically saying, well, look, he appeared unto me and said this. But, um, you know, when Laban first catches up to Jacob, he says, you know, what, is, what hast thou done? And it sounds pretty reasonable at first. He says, you know, thou hast stolen away unawares to me and carried away my daughters. But like he says this, taking away my daughters as captives. Like, what do you mean he's, he's taking away your daughters as captives? They're his wives. It's not like he's just come and stolen your daughters. He's been working. He worked for you for 14 years for those wives. And Laban has this attitude of like, you're just stealing from me. And this is that possessive, envious, covetous attitude that he has. Just thinking, mine, mine, mine. Everything's mine. These children are mine. These daughters are mine. This cattle's mine. Even though he's already made agreements and he doesn't care about the agreements he's made. That's why he's changed Jacob's wages 10 times because he had no respect unto those agreements he made with Jacob. Just saying, okay, well, yeah, that's what I said before, but now I'm changing that. And after 20 years, he's going to be like, yeah, well, now you're just stealing my, my, my daughters. Yeah, this isn't your stuff. It, it all belongs to me. And this is the attitude that Laban has, a wicked, wicked attitude. And he says, Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me, and thou didst not, and didst not tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and with songs, with tabret and with harp? Yeah, he's saying that now. And can you imagine if Jacob would have gone to him? Is he going to really throw a big party for him and say, Oh yeah, we'll send you off and give you the proper goodbyes? No, he wouldn't. He'd be like, No, you can go but everyone else is staying with me. And Jacob knew that, and that's exactly how he responds in um, verse number 31. It says, And Jacob answered and said to Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Peradventure thou wouldest take by force thy daughters from me. Jacob had very good reason to think that his daughters were going to be taken by force from, from him because of everything that Laban's exhibited and even just the fact that Laban came to him and saying, Look, it's in my power to do you hurt. He's like, I can do you, I can hurt you right now and I'd be righteous. But then he goes on to answer him because, because Laban also brings up, he's saying, okay, well, it's bad enough that you, you know, you took my daughters and all this other stuff and fled, but now you're going to take my gods too. You're going to take my images. You know, that's what it is. And Jacob's like, this takes him aback because he's like, what are you talking about? You know, Jacob fears God. Jacob fears the Lord. He's not going to be stealing any of Laban's image. He doesn't need these false gods. He doesn't need these, these objects that he's going to carry around with him and call them a god. Now, if someone's going to steal your god, I think you've got the wrong god. If it's possible for someone to come, I mean, when's the last time you've had that problem and someone just said, hey, someone stole God, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's laughable. It's a joke to think that anyone could say, you've stolen my God. But obviously Laban was an idiot because he came after him saying, you know, you've stolen my image. You've stolen my gods. You know, how am I going to worship my gods now? You have them. You took them from me. But remember, Jacob didn't realize that his wife actually did. Rachel did take them. And, you know, we don't know exactly why Rachel stole them, but, but she had taken them with her, and this is what he says. He says, with whomsoever, in verse 32, with whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. 
Before our brethren discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. So he's saying, okay, you know, you're, say, you're claiming that I stole your stuff? Fine. Search it out. And whoever has them, put them to death. That's how confident Jacob was because he's saying, look, I didn't take your stuff. And if whoever is found stealing your stuff, let them die. He didn't know Rachel took them. But so here's, you know, Laban starts looking. It says in verse 33, and Laban went into Jacob's tent. So the first thing he does, he's checking Jacob out, right? And into Leah's tent and into the two maidservants' tents, but he found them not. Then went he out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now, Rachel had taken the images and put them in the camel's furniture. So, when it says the camel's furniture, I think it's basically just like a saddle or something for the camel that they're riding upon, right? And she's able to stuff them underneath somehow. And when he's searching everything, she has explained, she's like, look, it's, the, it's, it's my time, that, that manner of women. She's like, you know, forgive me for not getting up because of my issue that I'm having as a woman. And um, hopefully you understand what that means. It should be self-explanatory. But she says that, you know, I can't get up before you. Um, and he searched and he wasn't able to find the images. So now at this point, Jacob gets really angry because now he's gone through all of his stuff. He searched for them and could not find them. And verse 36 says, And Jacob was wroth, he's very angry, and showed with Laban. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What did I do to you? What did I do wrong? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before my brethren and thy brethren that they may judge between us. Like, bring it out. Come on. Tell me what my problem is. Bring it out here and show it to everybody. Why are you so angry? Why are you hotly pursuing after me? What have I done wrong? He says, This 20 years have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. Say, Look, I didn't take. Any of yours. I've been working for you for 20 years. When did I ever take your stuff? When did I ever do you wrong? He's like, when there was losses, I took the brunt of that. I paid for it. That's what he says. That which was torn of beasts, so when other animals came and, and, and devoured one of the animals, he says, I brought that not unto these. I didn't bring that to you to, to say, oh, hey, this is what happened. He bare the cost of that. He bare the burden. He says, I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. And he's saying, look, in, in, in Mo the Mosaic Law, which it wasn't in effect yet, but in the Mosaic Law, you know, the Bible outlines if you're watching over someone else's stuff and a thief comes in and steals at night, that like, you're not held responsible for that. Like, it's something that, that happens, but, but you are not going to be held responsible and liable for that to happen because some thief came in. Now, like you say, if you, if you were part of that thievery, then yeah, you know, you're going to pay for that. But, you know, if it's stolen at night, you can't control that. You, you, you're, not, you're not expected to be responsible for that. But Laban held Jacob responsible. If, if stuff got stolen at night or by day or whatever, someone came and took it, he was responsible. After all of that, basically what he's saying, look, after all the way that you treated me and I dealt with you and I bear your losses, I did all this stuff, now you're going to accuse me of stealing from you and stealing your gods nonetheless? You know, like, like I don't worship those stupid things. It says in verse 40, Thus I was in the day the drought consumed me and the frost by night and my sleep departed from my eyes. He was out there in the, in the dry the hot, the cold, the frost, you know, thirsty, hungry. He's out there serving and working hard, not getting enough sleep. He says, Thus have I been 20 years in thy house. I served thee 14 years for thy two daughters and six years for thy cattle. And thou hast changed my wages 10 times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me. Surely thou hast sent me away now empty. God hath seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. So he's saying, you know, after all of this I did for you, this is the way you're treating me, but the only reason why I'm even able to have anything today is because of God. He's given God all the glory and respect because he also knows what type of man Laban is. And think about Laban too. I mean, he started off even by, by deceiving Jacob by giving him Leah instead of Rachel. 
Jacob wanted to marry. He loved Rachel, and that's who he wanted to marry. But Laban swapped out the daughters and gave him Leah instead. And, and you know, there's this whole mess that, that came as a result of that as well with now Jacob marrying multiple wives. And, and we've already kind of gone into the mess of polygamy and, and all of the hardship and heartache that that brings and how that's not God's will to be married to more than one um, woman. But let's keep reading. We're going to finish out this chapter. Verse number 43 says, And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, Look at his attitude. These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters or unto their children which they have born? This is the way he's viewing it. Now we can understand what Jacob is thinking when you know, he didn't want to even let him know that he's going. It's like, we just need to get out of here. Because he probably would have, he's right, he probably would have just left there empty-handed with no wives, no children, no nothing. He would have probably just been kicked out because of the way that Laban views everything. He let, he let this wealth get to his head to the point to where he just wants it all. And I don't know where everybody is financially, but I'll tell you what, we need to make sure that in all things, that, that whether we are abased or whether we abound, that we know how to deal with all things, that we give God the glory, that we don't get lifted up with pride, that we don't get caught up in the cares and the riches of this world and, and get focused on the wrong thing and get, get that love of money, which is the root of all evil, and get so focused on those things that... that it eats us up inside and we get covetous and start having this type of an attitude, this selfish attitude. And that's what it is. People who are seeking after money end up being very selfish people, self-centered because they're thinking about me, me, me. How much money can I make and, and satisfying their own flesh and satisfying their own desires as opposed to the Christian attitude of esteeming others better than yourselves. Thinking about what can I do to help other people out. I'm not worried about how much money I can make. I'm worried about how I can help someone else succeed, how much benefit I can be to somebody else and help you out and be there for you and not be so worried about myself. If it means, hey, well, maybe we have to go through a little bit more of a financial burden, but we're going to help this person out because they're in, in great need and we need to help them. That's the, the right attitude. That's a godly attitude to have as opposed to this mine, mine, mine. Everything, everything you see here is mine. I know you've been working your fingers to the bone, but that's still all mine. That's what Laban is saying here. And it's wicked. Verse 44. Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant. I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made an heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it Jigar Sehadutha, but Jacob called it Galead. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore is the name of it called Galead and Mizpah. For he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. Now, you've got a pretty messed up relationship with your in-laws if you have to like set up this, this boundary of this heap and saying, okay, we're going to make this promise. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to cross this and you're not going to cross this to come to me to hurt each other. That's, it's gotten pretty bad in your relationship if you're making this type of a vow and this type of a promise. But this is what it came to where they're saying, okay, because, and look, was Jacob looking to do harm to Laban ever? No. Laban was the one pursuing after him. Laban was the one who was aggressing and, and really was there to do hurt. So, good thing probably for Jacob that they're making this agreement, right? But here's the thing too, okay, as, as a Christian, you know, when you're doing the right thing, you need to be able to expect adversaries. You need to be able to expect people are going to hate you, they're going to they're gonna treat you bad. Oftentimes, you know, Christian men on the job, you know, people don't like you because they know that, that you 
you know, are, are this weird fundamentalist or, or you, you believe the Bible and you actually believe it to be true and you don't just pick and choose certain things that sound good. You actually believe the whole book and people will persecute you for that. And they'll look down on you and they'll try to and they'll lie about you. And you may have all kinds of repercussions happening at work as a result of just your faith. Even though you're not trying to do them bad, even though you're a good employee, even though you're doing all this good stuff, you may have a lot of people that are out there to hate you. But how you deal with that is very important. You need to maintain your integrity. Maintain your work ethic. Don't let that persecution, you know, give give you a bad attitude to the point to where. Now you're just going to change you, the way that you are. Oh, all these people are fine. I'll show them. You know, I, oh, they, they have it out for me. Yeah, I'll do something back to them and, and try to gain vengeance and things like that. Look, we need to have the, the proper attitude when dealing with this. And it's an attitude that's a godly attitude that, that's just going to say, you know what? God sees everything. I can't hide anything from God. I'm going to work my best before God. He'll see the, the honestness and the sincerity that I have and that I am really working hard here even though I've been done wrong, and, and he's going to recompense me and do what's right. So they make this heap, and he says, okay, you're not going to come over to me. I'm not going to come over to you. And he says, you know, if, if you marry any other women, then, then basically this is null and void. He's like, you need to take care of my daughters, but, um, but that's it. And then verse 53 says, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us. And Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread, and they did eat bread, and tarried all night in the mount. And early in the morning Laban rose up and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them, and Laban departed and returned on his way. So Laban ends up leaving without doing anything, any harm to him, and he's able to leave in peace. Let's uh, bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the, the lessons that we can learn here. God, I think one of the big takeaways from this chapter is um, that we need to be uh, upright. We need to be able to, to be people of our word. When we say something, we mean it, dear God, that, that you will hold us accountable and that you, will, um, you hear our vows and that we don't slack or defer to pay it, dear Lord, but that we do what we say we're going to do and also that we can be choosing the, the right way to deal with our adversity or with our afflictions, dear God, that we can work and do the things that we're going to do as if we're serving you. And um, we know that if we're doing what's right, that you are with us. We know that this life isn't always going to be easy. We know that there are going to be trials and tribulations and persecutions that are going to come as a result of our righteous living, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please just, just strengthen us and comfort us and help us to, to understand more completely that you will be with us and that you are with us when we're doing what's right and that we shouldn't have fear of what man can do unto us, dear Lord, but that we would just walk by faith and not by sight, dear, dear God. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.